Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Our Father's Word, how fantastic. Our Father is still reasoning with uh, His children and as to how He created all things, set it up for us, that we're His, and yet man continues to want to whittle idols and make religions out of every other things. And that upsets our father. He's jealous. And quite frankly, if you, want, if you want his blessings removed from you, just drift off away from the true word of God and see how far you get. He, in the last lecture, he had quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 16, the great song of Moses about how that uh, Jeshurun, which is a name for Israel when they're a good time Charlie, and forget God, um, how that they worship something that's not a God even. And of course, that's the Antichrist, which is Satan in the future sense. Having said that, let's pick it up, if we may, with chapter 43, verse 13, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Yea, before the day was, I am He. I mean, before there was ever a day, I was there. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Who, who in the world thinks they could turn it back? You know, to get in God's way, when you think of the awesomeness of nature, uh, which, which he can control, uh, and what man can do is a pittance compared to that. Our Father simply is our Father. He created all things. He handles all things. And naturally, an intelligent person is going to be with him. Verse 14, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer. There's that kinsman Redeemer, that legal terminology. Nearest of kin, I can redeem you. The Holy One of Israel, for your sake, I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans, whose cry is in the ships. In other words, um, I'm sending Cyrus, is what he's talking about. Now, as I said the other day, Hezekiah was not a bad king. It was the house of Judah that was bad. And Hezekiah, with, with the idol worship and everything else, he tried to clean it up. And God did respect that. But there were five dialects of these Chaldeans, Babylonians. And God said, I, I'm taking care of all of them. Verse 15, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. And there is no other, King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, verse 16, thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea. In other words, I, if I want to, you can take that Red Sea and I can make a dry path right across it. In a path in the mighty waters, he did that for Moses. Okay, 17, which bringeth forth the chariot and the horse. Pharaoh was right on his heels. The army and the power, they shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. They don't exist anymore is what God is saying. So our father knows how to protect his own. Our father knows how to lead and direct. He said, hey, if I, I brought Moses out of it, I brought all of the people against a mighty army, I can cut it. I can do it. And he certainly documented that at that day. There would be many who say, well, that was just kind of an act of nature. No, it was an act of God. It is written. He said it. It is so. Verse 18. Remember ye not the former things? Can't you look back on it? Neither consider the things of old. In other words, there's nothing new under the sun, and that that goes around comes around. That's the same way it's going to be, so listen and learn from it, okay? And um, it, it is all connected, if you would, with the end times. So you can learn from that. Verse 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Question. I will even make a way in the wilderness 
and rivers in the desert. I can do that, what he's saying. He knows how to take care of his own. And of course, we're looking future even now. This is a new thing. Just as, just as he brought uh, Moses out of the hand of Pharaoh, and just as he brought Noah through the flood, he's going to bring us through the flood of Satan's lies in the end times into the wilderness. Our father is able, but do you know something? You've got to trust him. You've got to love him. And you've got to believe him. I mean, the nearest relative you have, he identified that by saying, I am your redeemer. And the legal terminology of that is kinsman redeemer, meaning I have the right to help you and claim you because he's your father. Okay. So he has every intention of overcoming and protecting his own. Verse 20, the beast of the field shall honor me. They'll appreciate it. The dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. And of course, my chosen narrows this down all the way, if you would, to the election in the people from whom the elect are chosen or came from. Those that basically love God have nothing to worry about. Why? Because God takes care of his own. But what is the water that waters in the wilderness of the end times? It's Christ who is the living water. The water that God sends. You know, when you read either in the book of Revelation or when you read in the millennium chapters of the great book of Ezekiel, what is it that comes out from under the throne of God? A stream of waters. And this is spiritual, okay? Spiritual food for spiritual bodies, water that flows forth and, and provides for all. Our Father is able and um, naturally he always takes care of those that love him. Verse 21, this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. In other words, they're, they're going to honor me. And it was through these people that would naturally, eth ha'adam in the Hebrew tongue, that would come the Messiah. And naturally the Messiah then is the savior of all. The ethnics, ethnos, everyone, everywhere. Okay. Uh, and that's why um, the honor, okay, verse 22. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob. You didn't ask. But thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. You, um, you don't worship me. You don't listen. And here comes that word Jeshurun again. A good time, Charlie. Man, when things are going good, it seems like God's children kind of forget him take him for granted. But boy, let the least little thing go wrong and it's, oh, God help me. They can sure turn back then. Verse 23, he, he's kind of dressing them down a little here. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle, that's the lambs, okay, uh, of thy burnt offerings. Neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Uh, I haven't complained about it, and um, I've um, let it slide at that, but I'm watching you, and I know you haven't produced. That's what he's saying. 24, thou hast brought me no sweet cane with, with money. Neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices. The fat all belongs to God. Why? It's, it's poison to you. Um, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities, with your faults. You worry me to just, God has emotions. 
being jealous and with vengeance belonging to him, um, he says, you've wearied me. I'm getting tired of it. I'm getting full of it. 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions. Think about that a minute now. For mine own sake, not yours, mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. In other words, uh, what, what happens when you blot something out? It's gone. It doesn't exist. He says, when you repent, I, I'm the one that goes to that book of life and I blot out your sins. They're gone. And I don't want to hear about them anymore. I don't, I don't even want you to bring it up. I don't want to remember. Now, it's important that you remember, for to remember is not a continuation of the sin but it is so that you don't make the same mistake all over again. It's called experience. Whereby you can remember the problems the sin got you into. And also you can help others with your witness of what sin can do to you. But don't bring it up to God that you need forgiveness because he's already forgiven. And when he says, I don't want to remember, that's exactly what he means. Because to ask for for forgiveness a second time is an insult to God. Because when he forgives, that is it. It is written, no more need be said. Period. It's blotted out. It is gone. End of story. And, and uh, God wants you then to get about serving him, about taking care of business, okay? Verse 26. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. What is he saying here? Put me in remembrance of my promises I've made to you. Let's, let's uh, plead together. That means let's sit down and let's talk about it. Let's talk about it together. Father loves it when you talk to him. That's prayer. Okay. And uh, not some long written out dissertation, but simply saying, Father, I love you, and this is what the situation is. You promised that you would always be with us. You would not leave us nor forsake us. I need you now. That's the kind of talk he loves to hear. You see, if you don't remind him, you, you understand what he's saying here. Remind me of my promises, because if you don't, probably you're not going to collect on it. Okay. He wants to hear from you because that documents that you're a believer, that you love him. And the fact that he wants you to come together and plead with him, that means talk to him. Why? Well, he's, he gets lonesome like everyone else. He created man for his pleasure. And he enjoys man putting him to that pleasure. How is it that they don't buy sweet cane. What is it talking about? Well, what is the sweetest thing in the world? It's love. You don't go out and tell God you love him. And that's what he wants from you. That sweetness. You don't even have to buy it. Just tell him, Father, I love you. <clears throat> Talk to him. Call to remembrance his promises. He loves it. Makes his day. And when you make his day, he's certainly going to make yours. He's your heavenly father. Do you remember back? What, what did he say in verse 21? I formed thee. Your mother gave birth to you, but he formed thee. He's your father. He's the nearest relative you have. And he says here, come on. Remember my promises to me. Remind me of them. And let's talk about it. Let's plead together. You know. Verse 27. Thy first father hath sinned, and thy teachers hath transgressed against me. Now, there's a lot said there. Your first father, meaning some of the, the fathers down through the time, and even your own father sometimes. But <clears throat> I can't stand to let... Um, thy teachers go by without properly translating that. It's interpreters. Okay. The 
Thy first father hath sinned, and thy interpreters have transgressed against me. Why? By false transgression, by false interpretations. By not interpreting the accurate word of God, whereby the very thoughts of God are conveyed through the translation to communicate. But not just to communicate, but to communicate truth. Well, what is truth? Truth is the Word of God. And what he's saying is, is some of your would-be so-called priests or preachers are not properly interpreting the Word of God. They're twisting it. Now, God himself speaking needs no interpreter if, uh, if you understand the language that he is speaking in. Otherwise, if it comes from the Hebrew language, which this does, then someone had to interpret it, and you need the tools to be able to check it out for yourself. Yes, you can. As if you have the tools I recommend to be able to check out an interpreter yourself. Example, if I say a word means a certain thing in Hebrew, if I say Moses means drawn from the water, you can check me out. And you, and, and you should if there is a question. Our Father does not like false interpretations. Our Father does not like people that interpret the word to solve, uh, to salve their own situation rather than truth. That's why he said, hey, put me in remembrance of my, my promises and let's get together and talk about it. And that's what you want to talk about the interpreters as well. But there's no excuse for you not to have the ability to be able to check it out for yourself. Verse 28, therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary. I cannot let that stand. Uh, uh, anyone would not let that interpretation stand. Do you know what the sanctuary is? That's the house of God. You don't have princes there. You have priests. So let's read it like it should be translated. Therefore I have profaned the priest of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. What is he talking about? Well, it goes pretty deep. But you can read what he's talking about it comes to pass in Amos chapter 6, verse 14. And it's when you open the door and allow in Hamath. That's the Kenites. And it happens, the, the English is in the wilderness, they interpreted that, but it, the word in, in the Hebrew is Arab, which means at the close of the day, neither night nor day, but in the dusk of the day. When you let that Kenite in, you're hurt, especially if you don't know anything about it. God is very plain. And if you're not careful, all this involves you in many hang-ups and snares. That truth will just simply cut away the, the ribbons of, that bind you and you're free. Learn the truth, and the truth will set you free. The words of Christ in St. John chapter 8, verse uh, somewhere along about 32, somewhere in there. The truth will set you free. So Amos chapter 6, verse 14, don't get involved in that curse. Don't let Hemoth, that's the Kenite, um, uh, put strings on you. Satan loves it when you allow it. I think that's one of the most beautiful chapters in the fact that God is pleading with you to remember him of his promises. Remind me. Come and talk to me. Let's talk together. Let's talk about it. Well, because he wants to bless you. But you've got to be open to it. You've got to ask. You've got to be obedient. And you have to think think and you have to interpret properly whereby you know where the trouble comes from that you don't slide into it. Chapter 44 verse 1 Yet now hear O Jacob my servant the thought continues 
and Israel whom I have chosen. And he makes no, uh, no uh, qualms about it, his witness right here. Verse 2, Thus saith the Lord that made thee. He did what? He made thee. And formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. And here he even um, uh, supremely happy is what Jeshurun means. Good time, Charlie. Unfortunately, as it is written in the great song of Moses, which the overcomers sing in the end, Jeshurun, simply when the good times are rolling, forgets God. And you don't want to do that. Okay? Just because God blesses you, and the wonderful thing is that he formed you, and the wonderful thing that those blessings can bring on many, many good things, don't get so happy with it that you forget to go talk to God. He loves you because, after all, he is family. And he has chosen. That's special. He chose you because he has duties for you to do, especially you in the end times when sons and daughters are both delivered up before the false Messiah. It's called witnesses, and that's what kind of this is about, is witnesses. Three. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, just your children, and my blessings upon thine offspring. Our great nation is not an accident. Remember before? Remind me. Remind me of my promises. When you think of our nation, remember that. Talk to me about it. Plead with me about it, okay? I, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to water you when you're thirsty. And na naturally, what is the living water? It's Christ, of course. Verse 4. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. In other words, your, your children when you lead them by the way of the Lord, where he waters them, it's like a willow tree growing right by a pond of water. It's huge. It grows. It, your children do the same way. They, they burst out in the Lord. Ask him. Remind him of the promise and plead with him. That means simply talk to him. These are not idle words. Though some... Uh, misinterpreters might like to make you think they are. They're good words. They're from your father, your kinsman, redeemer. Verse 5. One shall say, I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, the prince that prevails with God. Okay, Israel. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. That is to say, the prince that prevails with God. Ultimately, what do we call ourselves and what is the prince of princes? King of kings and Lord of lords is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we call ourselves Christ men's or Christian. And God loves it because he sent that Christ as our savior and that happens to be the title of this great book we're studying now, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah meaning Yahweh's salvation, his way to it. And you won't find our father discussing any closer or more personal than in these chapters where he said, I formed you, I made you, you're mine. And I love you. And I will take care of you. And so naturally they call their self by his name. Verse 6. Thus saith the Lord the King of Israel. And his Redeemer the Lord of hosts. That's the one that paid the price for kinsman Redeemer. 
I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God, and there isn't. There's only one, and it's our Father. I mean, you know, think how precious that is, beloved. You're a child of the living God. He formed you. Verse 7, and who, I like to say, who else, as I, shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, question, all the way from the beginning, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. In other words, um, I've told you, I caused it to come to pass. Let someone else that claims to be a God, if there should be one, do the same. They can't, of course. When you remember from ancient times of old, it has always gone down exactly the way God said it would. Why? He's in charge. It's real easy for him. Verse 8, fear ye not. You don't, you don't have to be afraid. Trust him. Neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time? And have declared it? Haven't I assured you? Ye are even my witnesses. And he counts on you as a witness. That's important, beloved. Is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any, and there isn't. The word God, as it is utilized here in the Hebrew, is rock. And there is no other rock like our rock. That, is, that same word is utilized in the great song of Moses. I know I've mentioned that two or three times, but it's quoted by God. The, the very words being pulled from that song of Moses. And he even brings Moses up and having delivered Moses, he brings up Jeshurun, which is a part of that same song of Moses. Uh, making it prevalent in your mind that he is our rock. Now, why do you think he named Satan the king of Tyrus? Because he's the imposter, and Tyrus in the Hebrew tongue means rock also, or stone. But it's certainly not our rock. Our rock is not their rock. And from the troublemakers he mentioned back in the 28th verse of the last chapter, the entering in of Hemeth, you better know it. And it would help you a great deal to understand it. Hey, there is no other God. What am I saying and what is God saying? There is no other place anyone is going to bring you in blessings that are eternal. Someone might tickle your fancy for a few minutes. But to give you eternal life, there's only one. There's only one that can bring that to pass. And do you know that he thinks enough of you that he said, Hey, come on, remind me of my promise. Remind me that I said that. Remind me that I said I'm your kinsman redeemer. Remind me and let's talk about it. He wants you to open up to him, to claim those promises and to be a part of it for he is your rock. And when you are on that rock, nothing can shake you. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of anything because your father will protect you. Your father will take care of you. And quite frankly, um, he uh, at the same time sees that you have the common sense and the knowledge to know how to protect yourself. He switches his thought now and we kind of go back to what you face if you're not careful. Verse 9 they that make a graven image are all of them vanity. They're empty-headed. That's what vanity means, is empty. And their delectable thing shall not profit. There's no profit in it. No blessings. And they are their own witnesses. They're a witness also. Look at them. They see not... 
nor know that they may be ashamed. They, they are not even ashamed of what they do when the Creator, the Redeemer, loves them and is there to help them. They merely go along with their empty-headed ways in life. Um, I don't believe there's a God. I am so intelligent. The professor told me there was no God, and I believe the pet professor, even though he, his elevator stopped short of the top floor. You know, um, people in the academic world need to get a life. You need to wake up and understand, and thank God most young people recognize a fluke and a fake when they see one. All right to make a passing grade, but you don't have to believe their baloney. False teachings, misinterpretations. It's kind of sad, but God knows it. Remind him, talk to him about it. Verse 10, who has formed a God? That's a lowercase, a small g, not, not our father. Who made a God? or molded a graven image that is profitable for nothing. Who, what, what he's saying is, is who but a fool would do that? And the answer, of course, is a fool. All right. Verse 11, Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, uh, they are of men. In other words, they're not God. They're Adam. They're a common human being. Let them all be gathered together and let them stand up, yet uh, they shall fear and they shall be ashamed together. Um, let them what? Stand up for God? Well, for their God? It's not going to do them any good. Do you know something? When they whittle out of God, they have either got to nail it down or fasten or something, or it can't even stand up on its own, much less help somebody else. That's ignorance. That's why it's an empty-headed person that would believe such a thing. Our Heavenly Father said, hey, remind me of my promises. I want you to help me remember them. He doesn't need any help, but he wants you to remember it. And let's talk about it. Don't forget to have a talk with him today. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark